We're starting off with uh, congestive heart failure. Maybe if we have time, which I doubt we will, we can do over a little of the STEMI and STEMI stuff. But um, we know that congestive heart failure is an impairment in the, the, the pumping of the heart or the filling of the heart, um, usually the left ventricle, that results in an inadequate uh, cardiac output, right? And remember we talked about cardiac output in our video on, I think it was hypertension. Um, we talked about all these things that kind of affect cardiac output. When we're talking about um, heart failure, we talk a lot about cardiac output, preload and afterload. So just make sure you kind of understand those things. Um, I'm going to go over them really quick because you won't understand <laughs> the rest of the, the review. Um, so remember that preload is the amount of blood in the heart just before it contracts. It's also basically end diastolic volume. Um, I wouldn't be I wouldn't be surprised if you get a question where you need to you need to basically define know what preload and afterload are. Um, it's easy to remember which is which, right? Because preload is before systole, uh, and then afterload is after systole, um, and that's the resistance that the heart is working against to eject the blood. So you know it has to do with your systemic vascular resistance, um, and that's affected by a bunch of other different things as well. But those two things are really the only things that are kind of confusing, I guess, about this. Um, obviously, your heart rate is going to affect cardiac output, right? Because the faster your heart is beating, the more, well, hopefully, the more blood it's able to pump out, right? Myocardial contractility is super duper important. Um, if your heart isn't able to contract fully or contract um even just strong the way that it's supposed to, you won't have as high of a cardiac output. Pretty kind of basic, right? Um, so before we go into like systolic, diastolic, heart failure, and we'll separate those out for you guys because I know it's confusing. Um, let's just talk about the, the two, these are the two major contributors to uh, heart failure. It would be hypertension and coronary artery disease. And we've gone over these so many times that I know you know already um, kind of like the, the predisposing factors for both of those things. So your risk factors for hypertension, coronary artery disease are this are pretty much the same and your risk factors for heart failure are pretty much the same except we're going to add in now we've had um, possibly an MI um, but again even that MI is coming from these kind of risk factors you put yourself at with the hypertension and all the things you've um, you know your high LDL and what have you for your coronary artery disease so that's really good for the test it's all fairly fairly similar uh, dash diet, exercise, blah, blah, blah. You guys don't miss any of that stuff. Remember smoking and alcohol, always bad, right? Um, so the two kind of main things that happen when you have this, you know, hypertension, coronary artery disease kind of constellation, um, we talked about how sometimes that can end in left ventricular hypertrophy, meaning that that blood that is, um, is supposed to be going out from the left ventricle into the um, into the aorta and out to the body is fighting so hard to get out because you know what's out here is uh, putting up so much pressure the heart has to work really really hard and what happens is that left ventricle because the left ventricle is is really that major ventricle that pumps everything out to your body it's usually the one that gets damaged right and so the left ventricle becomes uh, hypertrophied, meaning that the muscles begin to thicken in response to this extra work that it's doing. And then in itself, when you've got that thicker muscle, you end up having um, higher kind of oxygen requirements for that bigger muscle. And it's kind of a cyclical problem. And that will happen until eventually um, it will kind of give out. There's no... Uh, they're kind of working against each other. Cardiac, you know, you're you're not getting enough oxygen to keep pumping this giant muscle, um, and eventually you'll end up with other kinds of remodeling. Specifically, you end up with this left ventricular dilation, uh, and then we'll talk about that in a second. The other kind of thing that may happen with these constellation of of I don't know problems or predisposing factors is an MI. Um, 
you know, unfortunately, we talked a lot about this in the other video, and it's nice to have talked about it first, but hopefully you guys have a good understanding anyway, um, that how an MI can result in the same kind of left ventricular remodeling um, um, and and often really what you what you end up with in heart failure is either this left ventricular hypertrophy or this left ventricular dilation and those are exactly what they sound like i think i have pictures down here um i do so you know here you've got uh you know, left left ventricle that is, I believe, is dilated. Sorry, if you can see my pointer, this one's dilated. This one, your right ventricle is dilated. And here you've got a left ventricle that's hypertrophied. And here you've got a right and sort of a left that's hypertrophied. It was hard to draw those. So, um, so hopefully you understand the difference between those two things and what's going to happen if we understand that if your heart is, is hypertrophied, um, you know, you're your cardiac output, it's a compensatory measure, right? So it wants to keep your cardiac output as stable as it can. So the heart muscles thickening and thickening and thickening. Um, so it will work to a certain extent, but it's requiring a lot more oxygen. And then when you have that dilation, which usually will occur after, um, you've got kind of these like, I said this in the other video, but the, the walls of your ventricle are kind of like big and saggy and loose. And it, it's you it's exactly it's like uh, when somebody who's like two sizes bigger than you borrows your sweater. Right. And they give it back and it's all stretched out. It's it's like that where uh, and then it can't it doesn't have the elasticity anymore to fully contract. And you end up with um, generally with with a very low ejection fraction, which we'll talk about in a second. So these are kind of the things that will contribute to congestive uh, heart failure, uh, chronic heart failure, heart failure. They all mean the same thing to me. I don't know if your teacher's picky about that, but um, other contributing factors are all things we've talked about. So again, things that will affect the hypertension and CAD. So I won't go over them again. Okay, ejection fra fraction is really, really an important concept when we're talking about. Um, you know, we're talking about heart failure. So you do need to know these numbers, but let's talk about what ejection fraction is. Um, so you have a left ventricle. I did actually go through this in the other video too. So if you don't get it here, you can go back and look at it there, but you have this left ventricle and inside of the left ventricle, you have about, and I'm gonna use 100 milliliters of blood. That is not the correct amount. I just use it because I suck at math and I like to use nice round numbers. So uh, you've got 100 milliliters of blood in this right before, um, right before it contracts and sends the blood out. So that's this, this moment right here is your preload. It's your end diastolic volume, 100 milliliters. When the heart contracts, it shoots out that blood, right? Um, and it shoots out normally about 70, let's say in a really good day, each day it shoots out 70, 75% of what's inside of here, okay? That is your ejection fraction. That's 75 milliliters out of 100 milliliters that came out when you contracted. Um, that is, uh, that's how you make the percentage, right? So that's, that's easy peasy, no, I guess no, uh, it's not really confusing, right? When it becomes confusing is when you have heart failure because you can have heart failure with a perfectly normal ejection fraction or you can have heart failure with a terrible ejection fraction. And that's because of um, kind of the way uh, the way the heart failure is, and it has a lot to do with what we just talked about, about the dilation and the uh, left ventricular hypertrophy. So I left a nice big blank spot here so I could draw. So exactly what we just talked about, right? It's 100 milliliters, 75 comes out. That's totally normal. In systolic heart failure, and we will go over this, but in systolic heart, heart failure, you have in that end diastolic volume, you have this nice, lovely ventricle. It's got you know, whatever muscle tone it has, let's say it's, it's fairly, it's fairly dilated and kind of saggy and it's, the muscle doesn't work really well. You still have that same end diastolic volume. You still have a hundred milliliters that's in there that needs to come out, 
But because this, because this muscle is so like dilated and stretched out, it can't push out that 75% that it normally does. Instead, it's only pushing out, let's say 50%. Um, 50 percent of what's in here so there's a hundred in here it's only pushing out 50 milliliters or, or half okay so that's a systolic problem the problem is that if the problem was with the pumping you have enough blood in here you have the same amount of blood as you normally do there's not no different there the problem is with your body pumping it out there isn't enough strength or whatever in the muscle to pump it out um, and so that is we that's systolic right that's a systolic problem because it's a problem with it's a problem during contraction or during systole during the time when you're supposed to be um, pumping it out Okay, so then if you have diastolic, what happens here, and oftentimes it happens with um, left ventricular kind of hypertrophy. So let's draw like the same kind of ventricle. I don't know why it's so much bigger, um, but here we've got hypertrophy. So the actual inside of the ventricle is quite a bit smaller, right? So what's coming in from the right um, from the right ventricle into the lungs and then back into the uh, left ventricle, it's, it's, it's not able to fill up, it's not able to put that 100 milliliters in here that it normally does. It only puts 50 milliliters in. That's all it can fit, right? And then during systole, it contracts, boof, and let's say it contracts Let's say it contracts the whole thing, which is generally not possible, but let's say it contracts every ounce of blood is in there, all 50 milliliters, and you end up with an ejection fraction of 100%, right? It's still only 50 milliliters coming out. It's still half of what a healthy, normal heart would be pumping out because there's a problem with the filling. There's a pro there isn't enough in there during preload during diastole so the problem is actually a filling problem not a pump problem and that's why you can end up with with congestive heart failure with a perfect ejection fraction your ejection fraction is 100 percent it's everything that's in here is coming out but what's in here is so low it's not enough to um to kind of perfuse the rest of your body so hopefully that helps a little bit i know that that's a really uh I found that I found the whole concept a little bit hard at first when I first took it. So hopefully that helps. Um, so that's when we talk here about this kind of um, uh, two types, I guess. That's that's what we're talking about: the systolic and diastolic, it's not left and right. I'll talk about that in a second. But so you have that systolic, right? Where oh, I hear a question. I'm just going to go back because I don't want to move forward if we're not completely um was what diastolic so the one over here that i was just talking about this one where um the problem is with the filling the problem is it's not it's not filling enough that is your diastolic right because if you think it through you guys know systolic blood pressure is the blood pressure when the heart contracts diastolic is when it's filling so that really is, it's the same thing here. Systolic heart failure is failure in the contraction or in the pumping. Diastolic is failure in the filling or in the preload, okay? So that kind of explains why you can have a perfect ejection fraction. If you don't understand that, if you, if you will listen to the, like we'll go through the rest of the stuff and when you come back and listen to it again, I think you'll, I think it'll click. Oh yeah, not just you, I'm saying everybody. It's a really hard concept. Um, I find it's something I spend a lot of time on, so it's, it's fine, ask whatever questions you need to. Okay, so we have these two different types. The systolic, again, we've, we've really just talked about these. So but just, just in case so you can kind of see it in words, um, systolic is a defect, defect in the ability to pump out the blood or eject the blood. It's not ejecting as much of what is in there caused by a defect in the left ventricles, um, an increase in afterload, meaning there's too much pressure outside of the heart that it's working against, so it can't eject all of it that it's supposed to, 
Uh, mechanical abnormality, this can happen even after an MI when you have a piece of uh, the heart that has had muscle that has died. Um, there can be problems with vent with um, uh, valves and all kinds of things that can that can cause that. And then with the diastolic, we're talking about um, the problem with filling. It's during diastole. What happens during diastole? The heart fill the the ventricles fill up. So your your left ventricular uh, um, ejection fraction is going to be it's actually moot. It doesn't even matter at this point. Um, it'll be normal, but you're only pumping out half the amount you normally are. Um, often this is caused by exactly what I drew over there, which is left uh, ventricular hypertrophy. This um, aortic stenosis was on on your slide. Um, it 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 was opposite of what uh, was in one of the textbooks. So I just I think you should go with what's on your slides. Um, and you can see how uh, aortic stenosis, so if you've got like a, a stenosed or a thin aorta, it just creates, increases that afterload, right? So when the, when the left ventricle is trying to push out, again, has too much to push out against, um, um, and it's unable to, uh, to push all the way out. So for me, logically, this aortic stenosis actually fits over here and the one textbook puts it over here and then the other textbook put it here um, so hopefully <laughs> hopefully you just won't have a question that's asking you that and and if you do I personally would go with what's on your slide which is which is aortic stenosis uh, can cause diastolic heart failure and then of course you have your cardio uh, hypertrophic cardio cardiomyopathy basically it's just hypertrophy uh, of the whole heart instead of just the left ventricle right um, so we've kind of gone through, yep, and again, <laughs> I just put this here again, remember that systole is the ventricles contracting, so the problem is pumping out, diastole is the ventricles relaxing, and so the problem is with the filling. You can have mixed heart failure where you have a, a, a mixture of diastolic and systolic, so you have poor systolic function, the muscle is weakened, um, you can't, it can't contract enough to push the blood out, um, you have a very, very uh, poor ejection fraction, but then you can also have a problem with the filling in that the blood that's getting into that left ventricle isn't enough either, right? And so that's a, that's a really big problem. You end up with very, very poor ejection fractions and you end up with, um, when they say biventricular, it just means it's affecting both of, usually affects both of the, the ventricles, not just the left. Most of the time when we're talking about heart failure, we're talking about the left ventricle. Um, left left sided heart failure is just more uh, more common and you'll see why as we go through. So I wanted to clarify that, yes, we have left sided heart failure and right sided heart failure um, and you can have left sided systolic heart failure or right sided systolic heart failure. You can have left-sided diastolic or right-sided diastolic. So you can kind of see how like these fit into, they're like double category, right? It fits into there. So if you have, and I'm sorry if this is repetitive, but I, it's, just, it's just really important. So I want to make sure everybody's getting it. If you have a left-sided systolic failure, it's the left ventricle has a pumping problem, okay, which we just talked about. But the right side can also have a pumping problem. For example, if you had a myocardial infarction on the right side and it caused problems with the muscle on the right in the right ventricle, then you could have problems pumping uh, from the right ventricle into the lungs. Um, and, and that would still be a systolic or a pumping problem. It's just on the right side. And then again, you have the same thing on the other side. We talked about how left-sided diast diastolic heart failure happens. Right-sided is the same thing. There's some kind of problem. Again, say you had an MI and you've, you've developed uh, right ventricular hypertrophy because of it, and now you, know, you have a smaller filling space here. This ventricle may be perfectly normal, but what's coming to it from the lungs because what's coming from it from the lungs is coming from the right ventricle, it's gonna be like less than is supposed to. It's gonna be half or 75% of what's actually supposed to be in there. So because the right ventricle has a filling problem. 
okay? So you can have a filling problem or a pumping problem on the left side or the right side. So hopefully that's, <laughs> hopefully that's clear. It's not too crazy, I don't think. Um, if you have any questions about that, ask. Be, feel free to ask before we kind of um, go for it. So, or just interrupt me, that's fine. Uh, so your body has these kind of like compensatory mechanisms, which we kind of talked about a little bit, um, for this decreased output. So when you have heart failure um, and your whether your ejection fraction is low or your ejection fraction is normal, but it's not enough blood that's coming out, your cardiac output is going to be low. And that's a problem because we need that blood to perfuse the rest of our organs and the rest of our body, right? So the body will compensate first by kind of kicking in the sympathetic nervous system. And if you remember from the video on hypertension, we went through what the sympathetic nervous system does. Remember, it it sends that epinephrine and norepinephrine to um, to the heart to kind of kick into gear that those those beta receptors and those beta receptors cause uh, vasoconstriction, an increase in heart rate, an increase in uh, systemic vascular resistance, and an increase in blood pressure. So it's just kind of your body's fight or flight response to the fact that we're not getting enough blood coming out of the heart. Um, it's the very first, you know, compensation that your body will, will attempt to make. It doesn't do a whole lot. In fact, it doesn't last very long and eventually it will give out and your blood pressure, um, mostly your blood pressure will fall. Um, and we're going to need something else to kick in. But again, it's that same, what I just said is just basically this whole same, you know, process uh, that we talked about in hypertension. And then eventually, over time, if we keep pumping against that, uh, you know, pumping extra hard and extra fast, trying to, um, sorry, trying to increase our cardiac output, eventually that heart muscle, um, you know, it, it's going to fail. There isn't, it isn't going to be able to continue doing that long term. Um, and again, we talked about it's, it's requiring more oxygen because it's working so much harder. Um, and eventually all of that is just going to come to a head and it's going to fail. Just really quickly, I just wanted to go back up here and remember that there were three things that those beta blockers or those beta, sorry, receptors on the heart um, do. It was the increasing the heart rate, increasing the blood pressure. And the third one's really important. It, in, it increases heart contractility. Um, this is what allows the heart to like pump extra hard, right? And also what, what causes kind of a lot of these problems. The heart is just working way, way, way too hard. Um, so then your, your body has this kind of other uh, compensatory uh, mechanism and it's, it's very much related to kind of what we talked about in hypertension as well, where it's a, a neural hormonal response because it involves uh, well, it involves the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. So again, <laughs> and you remember I wrote it here in case you forgot, but I mean, heads up, if you're going into this test, you need to understand this whole RAAS, like you need to understand it up, upside down and backwards. It's really, really important. It's important for your NCLEX too. Um, so when you have a decrease in cardiac output, you're not getting enough blood to the kidney. This triggers the uh, kidney uh, there's these specific cells in the kidney, which you don't need to know, um, to release renin. Um, and the renin then triggers a release of angiotensin 1. Then angiotensin becomes angiotensin 2 uh, because the ACE inhibitor uh, or, sorry, ACE enzyme uh, um, kind of works on that to, to turn it into angiotensin 2. Um, I'm not sure you need to know that ACE is made in the lungs, but it is. Um, and then what ha that that angiotensin two, the purpose of angiotensin two and what it does is really really important to know. So it's kind of got these main uh, things that it does. One thing is that it it triggers the adrenal cortex, which is basically just sitting on top of your uh, kidney. That's why it's called adrenal, right? Um, to release aldosterone. 
aldosterone's major job, uh, the, the big thing that it does, is it increases uh, sodium and water retention inside of the, the um, inside of the nephrons, right? And so we're going to have more water, uh, more fluid, more sodium, and the fluid follows the sodium. So if we increase sodium, we're going to increase fluid. And what that does is it, it's, it, uh, it increases our fluid volume, which you know will then increase your blood pressure, will increase your cardiac output. So that's kind of one way the body is compensating and how angiotensin plays a role, angiotensin 2. The other thing angiotensin 2 does is it causes uh, vasoconstriction, which then is going to um, uh, basically increase your systemic vascular resistance and increase um, your blood pressure, right? When you squeeze the tube, things are going to, it's like toothpaste. You squeeze that tube, it's going to come out a lot faster, right? The other thing, so there's, you know, again, three things with angiotensin 2. You've got the aldosterone, the vasoconstriction, and the, the third and last thing is the antidiuretic hormone. So it triggers a release of, of this antidiuretic hormone, or ADH, in the pituitary. Um, and the ADH, if you look at the word, you know what it is, antidiuretic. It's against diuresis. So it's going to do the same, a very, very similar thing to what aldosterone is doing, and it's increasing that water absorption um, in the distal tubule and creating uh, an increased uh, volume, right, fluid volume inside of the body. So that's all review. That's all stuff we should already know from hypertension, right? So we already knew that was kind of kicking in. Um, so you've got now this increase in blood volume and an increase in blood pressure. Um, this kind of release of angiotensin II plus the ADH and the catecholamines, catecholamines are these norepinephrine and epinephrine that's been released from your sympathetic nervous system. Um, when that's all in the body, it triggers this kind of this endothelin release. Um, and you remember the endothelin is kind of inside the walls of the, the vessels. Um, and this just causes further arterial vasoconstriction and causes an increase in cardiac contractility. Again, it's really just your body responding. There isn't enough cardiac output, and this is how it's responding, trying to increase that cardiac output. But if the problem isn't corrected um, over time, you are going to end up with, you. it's too long to have that kind of increased cardiac workload. Um, too long to sustain this vasoconstriction and higher blood pressure and more blood volume and really, really, really just that higher contractility of the heart. And you're going to end up with um, hypertrophy or dilation. And again, when you, uh, when cardiac output in general is the problem, um, a lot of that increase in contractility and what have you is happening in in the left ventricle and so that's why you end up mostly with a left ventricular hypertrophy and then left uh, ventricular dilation. Um, so yes, decreased cardiac function due to cardiac hypertrophy after that and contractile uh, dysfunction, death of myocytes, um, death of myocytes because it's not getting, the, the heart itself isn't getting enough blood now because the, the cardiac output is low plus the heart muscle is requiring all this extra oxygen to do that increased workload. Um, and all of that just puts to, comes together and you end up with heart failure. So um, I think it's important probably for a test to know that, you know, heart failure is considered a syndrome uh, more than a disease, kind of like metabolic syndrome, right? It's putting you at risk for all of these other things. Um, it's kind of weird because when you see syndrome, you think it's not as serious, but obviously you all know from, from work and from any experience you have, the heart failure is extremely serious, right? Um, I think these pictures down here are just kind of showing you um, like a, a view kind of of what, what I just talked about. So you have an increase in the, in the pressure in the ventricular chambers. It's going to stretch out that... Um, you know, stretch out that ventricle and you're going to have dilation. And then the opposite is true here. We've talked about that a lot. I just wanted, I guess, to put <laughs> pictures in for you. So um, let's kind of talk about like the path to left-sided heart failure. This way you won't uh, miss out on anything kind of 
during during the test. So this the side here in blue are kind of like the original problem, uh, the original thing that's going on that's causing eventually is going to cause left-sided heart failure. Um, dilated cardiomyopathy because because uh, those ventricles are dilated. We just we just kind of talked about that, right? Mitral and aortic regurg, uh, an MI we talked about because, um, and again, both of these things are going to affect the cardiac output. Um, severe hypertension, um, aortic stenosis again, and I wonder if aortic stenosis, where it ends up. See, it ends up in systolic, makes more sense. Cardiac tamponade, um, kind of let's go through like, um, for example, mitral and aortic, uh, no, let's talk about myocardial infarction. With myocardial infarction, you end up with that necrotic tissue. And let's say that necrotic tissue is over top of the left ventricular or left ventricle. And it kills some of those myocytes and they don't function anymore. Whatever area of that ventricle that is affected by the MI, so this here, this part is dead, it doesn't pump anymore. Everything around it is going to pump. But this is not going to, the, the signal that is coming from the SA and the AV node is not going to get through there and it's not going to pump. And so you end up with a lower um, kind of ability for the left ventricle to contract. The same thing happens in dilated cardiomyopathy, mitral regurg. Um, with mitral valve regurg, you know that uh, the blood that's supposed to be coming out of the left ventricle and going into, or sorry, out of the, I'm sorry, right of the, out of the left atrium and into the left ventricle um, is getting kind of bogged down because the ventricle, uh, sorry, the valve isn't working properly. You end up with the same kind of volume overload, the same kind of LV dilation, um, and that same decrease in cardiac uh, contractility. And eventually you will end up with a systolic uh, problem, right? The heart isn't able to squeeze or empty or contract well enough and you're going to have e a decreased ejection um, fraction. Similarly, uh, with things like severe hypertension, aortic stenosis, those things are increasing the afterload. So what the heart is working against to pump out. And so eventually you're going to have that same exhaustion of, of um, the left ventricle pressure, the same issues with um, contractility and left ventricular dilation or uh, hypertrophy and eventually leading again to it's unable to pump again. Um, and those are really the big main causes of your like systolic uh, left-sided. And then the diastolic, these are things, again, that are going to affect not the, the ability of the, the left ventricle to pump out, but the ability of the left ventricle to fill properly. Obviously, cardiac tamponade, um, you know, your, your left ventricular, uh, your left, sorry, ventricle can't relax and can't fill properly, can't get enough blood in. If you remember that cardiac tamponade, um, is the, so you've got the heart and then you have that pericardium around the heart, right? And you've got the, this is the, the, the parietal layer of that pericardium and this is the visceral layer of that pericardium. If you have a pericardial effusion for some reason, this area all fills up with fluid. It fills up to the point where your heart cannot contract anymore. There's so much fluid pressure pushing against it. So that's what it's talking about here. It can't contract, it can't relax, it can't fill properly. Um, hypertrophy, again, we talked about the, the actual space inside of that ventricle is smaller. The walls are too, uh, too stiff, really, to, to stretch out to compensate for the filling of the blood. Um, and again, you're ending up with that same kind of uh, failure, but this time it's caused because you're not getting enough into the left ventricle. The left ventricle is not opening enough. There isn't enough space in there, what have you. And you end up with that left diastolic um, heart failure. So hopefully that <laughs> hopefully that's making sense for you. Um, there, if you look up here in the kind of greenish color, um, it highlights what happens to the blood flow 
during left-sided heart fa failure. It's really just, um, you know, it's back and we've talked about it. So if, if you have a left-sided heart failure, whether it's caused by any one of these things over here, what's going to happen? You know that what's inside of your left ventricle is not getting pumped out. So what happens to it? Well, it just, if you look down at this diagram, it just sits in here. It builds up in here. Um, and eventually what will happen is it will start to backflow through, um, sorry, that's not, that's the wrong way, I'm sorry. It backflow through back into the left atrium. And eventually that will backflow to where it comes from, which unfortunately is the lung. And that is why with a left-sided heart failure, you end up with pulmonary congestion, pulmonary edema. Um, and eventually that fluid and that problem can actually back up right through to the right ventricle and then the right artery, sorry, right um, atrium and then back and cause right-sided heart failure as well. Um, very, very often people who have like left-sided heart failure for a long time end up with um, basically both-sided or, or a complete heart failure um, where the right and left side, you guys see those patients all the time. They have, they have crackles all the time, but they also have that pedal edema and um, the, the signs of, you know, uh, uh, ascites, what have you, of right-sided as well. So if you have a hard time, okay, so I'm a big proponent of, if you're trying to figure out an answer to a question, um, if you know, for example, how the blood flows through, through the heart, you don't have to memorize L equals lungs, left, L equals left side and L equals lungs so that you know what, so that you know left affects the lungs. If you just think about where that blood is coming from, you know it's coming from the right atrium. Where's it coming, or the left, sorry, left atrium. Where's it coming from before that? It's coming from the lungs. And if you have a problem with this pumping, it's just logic that it's gonna build up and backflow and backflow into the lungs. Um, but if that, if that kind of doesn't um, help you, then you can just kind of memorize um, L equals left, L equals lungs, and that helps. On the other video, I go through a really, uh, not long, but a good, a good video uh, reminder of how that blood flow works. Not just that, but how the conduction system works um, and all of that. And that's in the first like 15 minutes of that video. So if you go through it, that might help if you're not going to watch the whole video just to watch that part. Um, okay. So left-sided heart failure, because of that pulmonary con congestion, what are you going to see? So if the patient just has left-sided heart failure, it hasn't gone over to the right side yet. Um, actually, these, these, so yeah, it hasn't. You may end up with, let's look at some of these. I feel like these are backwards. <laughs> they are. Okay. <laughs> you guys, I'm so sorry. I'll switch these around when um, before I post this. Um, and, and hopefully uh, you guys won't judge me too much. But um, the left sided stuff is over here and the right <laughs> for some reason the right side is over here. Sorry, it was I was so tired creating these. So let's look over here. You have left sided heart failure. Um, and and it's going to affect the lungs. So what kind of symptoms do you have? You're going to end up with crackles from pulmonary edema. That fluid that's building up inside of uh, inside of your lungs uh, builds up and it pushes into the alveola, and it impairs gas exchange. So you end up with a lower O2 and a higher CO2, right? But it also is going to cause those pulmonary those crackles on inspiration because you're kind of popping open those those alveola. Um, when you breathe in, orthopnea um, is is problems with breathing when you're lying down. So you guys know, you know, when you have a patient with fair, having a hard time breathing with heart failure or whatever, um, you know to put them like in high fowlers or at least semi fowlers. Um, lying down, they have an extremely hard time um, catching their breath, and that's just because of gravity. That's because the, it backflows the blood even more, right? 
dyspnea, trouble breathing. Um, this dry hacking cough is often um, one of the first kind of signs that somebody's developing uh, left-sided heart failure. Um, they'll come in, they think it's a cold. Oh, I've had this cold for like weeks and now I'm having a hard time breathing. And we think, oh, they must maybe pneumonia. And a lot of times it does turn out to be um, heart failure, left side of heart failure. So it's a dry, the difference is it's a dry cough. It's non-productive. You're not producing any kind of sputum. Um, and it's obviously, it's not responding to medication because it's not, it's not a cold. It's not an infection, right? Um, what else is important here? Uh, this, this point of maximal impulse, the PMI, this is the place on your, um, and I talk about this in the other video too, so I'll just go through really quickly, but it's that, that place um, in the body where you as the nurse can feel and hear um, the, the heart pulse the best which is you guys know is, is basically your mitral valve so it's uh, fifth intercostal space uh mid clavicular line right so that spot right there when you have a left ventricular uh heart failure heart failure left side of heart failure and and that that left ventricle is starting to fill up with blood um it will actually shift that point of maximal impulse over to the side a little bit. So you can expect when somebody has a left-sided heart failure to have to listen for their uh, heart sound a little bit further to the left. Now, um, at that point, you know, I mean, you're not really looking for this that often. Any it's more of a test question than than I think uh, real life, but sometimes you do have to really kind of go over. Um, and the further you have to go over, the the more you realize like, okay, this is really a really big problem, right? Like the the more blood there is collecting in that uh, left ventricular, uh, left ventricle. I'm sorry. <laughs> um, what else do we got down here? Uh, paroxysmal nocturnal dyspnea it just means it's uh, a difficult time breathing at night uh, and that's usually because patients are lying down they lie down they have a difficulty breathing and then of course chain stokes are going to be um, involved in left-sided uh, heart failure um, towards the end um, you know if you're you're you know uh, like end phase um, and chain stokes uh, if you remember, they're, they're the ones that um, your breath gets deeper and deeper and deeper and deeper, and then it gets shallower and shallower and shallower, and then you have a space where there's no breath, a time of apnea, and then it starts over again. Okay, so um, just in case they describe it on a test and you have to know it's chain stokes. Um, really sorry that these got mixed up. I will fix them. So that's kind of the most important stuff about the left side. Um, and again, many, many people who have uh, right-sided heart failure, actually it began with left-sided heart failure. We'll, we'll look over here and kind of um, go through that. Sorry. So I made kind of a similar thing. These blue boxes are like the original, original problem. Um, and then the purple is kind of the pathway to the right-sided heart failure so you have let's just look over here because this right here i just want to highlight this the most common cause like i just said of right-sided heart failure is left-sided heart failure the left-sided heart failure increases uh the pulmonary blood pressure and then um once that happens, you end up with, if you look kind of, it's kind of bouncing, but if you look over here, you end up with that right uh, ventricle that's chronically exposed to um, that high afterload. So your, your right ventricle has to work extra hard against the backflow that's coming from the left ventricle. When you have right-sided heart failure that is orig originates like that from left-sided heart failure, um, because of that backflow, it's called core pulmonale. Um, this is something, I mean, you definitely need to know this for your NCLEX. I don't know if it was in your notes, but it's important to know. Um, so let's just start with, okay, some of the, some of the, um, what is happening here? I feel like I switched all of this stuff up. So let's talk about, okay, right ventricular, um, uh, 
right ventricular infarct, some, some of the things that can affect the right side on their own. Um, a, an infarction in the right side. So you literally have damage to the, the right side of the, uh, the, the, the heart, right ventricle. Same thing here, right ventricular cardiomyopathy. Some, something wrong. You know when they say cardiomyopathy, uh, it's just myopathy is like, uh, or opathy is, is, is disease or pathology. Something is wrong. And cardio is to do with the heart. And then the myo is muscle. So it's really kind of like this catch-all for there's something wrong with the heart muscle. Some other disease, some other um, problem. And then tricuspid regurge, same thing that's happening that we talked about with, with mitral regurge on the other side. Um, it's building up, it's building up pressure here. Um, this is your tricuspid valve right here. And if you're, um, there's, there's a problem with this valve, you're going to have kind of backflow between these two. And this, they will eventually uh, cause like a buildup of blood. Um, this is also why those valvular um, problems can, can create clots sometimes. And actually, just in case you don't get to watch the other video, um, if you have a clot in your right ventricle, can you, what do you guys think will, will happen? Like what is the, what is the, the, the big problem? What's going to happen with this clot? Where is it going to go and what's it going to do? Um, oh yes, you guys are answering. Yes, the PE. Awesome. And the reason you knew that so quickly is because you know where that stinking blood is going, right? You know, the blood's going through the heart, you know, it's coming in here. It's going through here. It's going through here. And now it's going to the lung. So if you have a right sided, anything going on in your right side and it's going towards towards the lung. It's going to go with the blood flow, right? Um, unlike heart failure where we're talking about something backing up. So if you have, let's say you have a blood clot caused by the mitral valve and it's sitting down <laughs> somewhere in this blur of stuff that I've made. You've got a blood clot right here. Where do you think that one is going to go and what do you think you're at risk for? I like it when you guys actually answer. It's really good. Would, nobody getting it? Yes! The best. Gabby, you're in here again. <laughs> um, you're awesome. <laughs> um, yeah, so 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 great, right? It's, again, like I said, I said this last night, but if you know where that blood flow is going, you know where it's coming from, you can put so much together. It's fine, Gabby. Um, and actually, uh, Actually, okay, we'll keep going here. So those are the things we're talking about. You've damaged kind of the right, the right side of the heart. This gets a little bit, um, let's go. So some of these things, I'm not going to lie, like some of these things I look at and I'm like, I have to walk this through um, on my own, the same way that I would do like during a test. So I'm thinking to myself, what would happen if the, there was something wrong with the pulmonary or the pulmonic valve. Okay, I look back here. This is the pulmonic valve. There's something happening here. You're going to get this backflow. You're going to get a problem with um, the pressure that this that this right right ventricle is working against. So it's going to create a, a problem in the right ventricle. That makes sense to me. So I'm just going to go back over here. We talked about left-sided heart failure, so I'm not going to do that again. Okay, so those are kind of the non-respiratory ones, I guess. Um, then we're going to hit into some more of these kind of respiratory. Um, so, so diseases that affect pulmonary vasculature, meaning um, le legitimately something mechanical that is going on. Um, you have, for example, a pulmonary um, embolism. Uh, so an acute pulmonary embolism is going to, depending on where it is and what it's what it's doing, it will increase that that pressure as well that the that the the heart is uh, working against, right? Depending on how big it is and where it is, but it can happen. Same with an increase in pri in pulmonary hypertension. If you have an increase in primary in hype in the hypertension in those pulmonary uh, pulmonary veins that are going to the lungs from the right atrium, you're increasing the right atrium's afterload. It's got to work against all of that resistance. Normally, that how does that primary hypertension happen? Okay, so primary hypertension caused on its own doesn't happen that often, 
but it does happen because of left-sided heart failure, right? That's what increases that, that pulmonary uh, blood pressure. And then, you know, you can have things that are wrong with the heart. Um, you know, scleroderma, for example, causes your heart muscles not to be able to, you know, fully kind of uh, contract. Um, there's all kinds of different, like, I wouldn't worry too much about these. They're just kind of there so that you have an idea. And then you have all of these issues that um, you've learned about kind of, you know, in your respiratory uh, units and stuff. So the biggest one here is your COPD, your chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, um, which causes um, hypoxic alveoli, um, which is meaning there's not, there's the gas exchange isn't happening. You don't have enough oxygen in the alveola. And then the, because of that, the pulmonary vasculature, meaning the veins and the, and the arteries and what have you that are leading in and out of the, the, uh, the lungs reflexively in a reaction to this hypoxia are going to constrict. And when they constrict, you're increasing pressure right? If you go back, um, if the pulmonary uh, vein, which is what carries, let's just go back here. The pulmonary vein is what's carrying that blood from the right atrium into the lung. Then if, if this has super, super um, um, high pressure, oops, sorry, um, or it I'm so sorry. Or it constricts for some reason because of maybe maybe because of COPD, whatever. It's creating that that same kind of pressure and, and backflow that's going to um, cause the right ventricle to be chronically uh, uh, fighting against a high afterload. Um, all of these other things, your interstitial lung disease, uh, respiratory distress, um, a chronic lung infection, those are all doing basically the same things um, and creating that very, very, um, you know, hard, 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 it's hard, just hard for the heart to pump out, right? And then or the, the right atrium or right ventricle, um, right wall tension is basically all the stuff we've talked about. I don't want to, and then uh, it's harder to get it out and you end up with, you're there, right-sided um, heart failure. Boom. Um, and so let's talk about what happens to the body when you have right-sided heart failure. So now that you guys know we've gone over ad nauseum, the blood flow through the heart, um, if the blood in the right ventricle backs up, what's going to happen? Where is it going to go and what's it going to cause? You don't necessarily have to answer, but it's fun when you do. <laughs> um, okay, let's see. The body, yes, peripheral edema, awesome, super happy. <laughs> Thank you guys. Um, so sometimes I feel like I'm talking to myself, so it's nice to. Um, so yeah, so it's gonna back up here, it's gonna back up into the right atrium, it's gonna back up through here, superior vena cava, back up through the inferior vena cava, and you're gonna end up with these kind of um, uh, problems in the rest of the body. So right, R equals right, R equals rest of body. And for some stupid reason, I got these mixed up, but you're going to end up with things like peripheral edema, um, but you can also end up with hepatomegaly, splenomegaly, uh, jugular venous distension, or JVD. Oh, uh, hepato and splenomegaly. Megaly just means enlarged, so you can actually have cardiomegaly, right? Um, and hepato is referring to the liver, and spleno is referring to uh, the spleen. The big, big one is that pedal edema, right, which I understand is part of peripheral edema, but pedal edema is what, because it's such a dependent body part, what you, where you see um, a lot of that, like, pitting pedal edema, right? Um, and then you get the JVD. So, so if you have a question on your test, which you likely will, and it's going to say something like, you know, you have a patient who has, I'm paraphrasing, has left left-sided heart failure. Which of the following, you know, would you see in them? It wouldn't be phrased like that. It'd be phrased better. And it's a select all that apply. Stop and think through, think through what we've just talked about, like how the blood is moving through the body. Because a lot of people will put JVD for left-sided heart failure. Um, the only way you're getting JVD with left-sided heart failure is if it's backed up all the way to right-sided heart failure, right? 
it just doesn't make sense when when your left side is is full it's backing up into the lungs when your right side is full it's backing up into your into your veins right and we're talking veins here so let's look at some of the other kind of problems that we have um, um, we can end up again we've got the peripheral edema hepatosis anasarca is just this like full body I don't know if you've ever had a patient with anasarca, but it's insane. It's just like full body. What you see in a in a, a person with heart failure in their like bottom, like their calves and feet, like on their entire body. Um, so they're constantly having to be like just Lasix, Lasix, and and they're weeping like all the time, not not crying. Their body is weeping. Sorry, <laughs> just to clarify. Um, you're going to, again, edema of the, the dependent body parts. And heads up, for those of you who haven't been in practice yet, that includes the testes. Okay, so I like to do this to my students. It's absolutely terrible. But um, when I know that I have a patient who is going to have dependent edema in their legs and feet and testes, um, I will send them in to do like a, like a, to clean um, and then just kind of watch to see what their reaction is. You can gain a lot of, uh, you can learn a lot about a person, about how they react to that when they're not expecting it, right? Um, so I know that's sort of mean. And so I kind of wanted to prep you guys that that does exist in case you haven't seen it. Um, oh, you guys, it is, okay, I'm recording this, so I have to be professional. Um, like sometimes those testes are like, like two thirds of the size of your head. Like they are huge, just, just, just huge. They're full of edema. Um, and so it, it's definitely a kind of a shock <laughs> when you first see it. Okay. So now you guys are prepared for that when you go to work. Uh, or yeah, it's what you guys already work with. Uh, weight gain. This is your big kind of indicator of, uh, how your kind of how your right sided heart failure is doing right um, as your uh, uh, fluids build up and back up into your body you actually will gain weight and I know that there's like um if any of you know know it but there's like a like one kilogram is equal to a certain amount of fluid if any of you know that I'd love to hear it I, I didn't have time to look it up oh someone's got it one kilo no no that's one kilogram is 2.2 pounds right um not sure if it's 2.2 liters because that would mean one liter and a pound are the same but anyway it, it doesn't really matter it's just basically they're they're directly they're di directly related as you as you gain fluid you gain weight as you lose fluid you lose weight um, this you have to be really careful of. Uh, you will see the lower extremities kind of swollen, um, shiny with a decreased hair. Be really, this is why we always, I can't stress enough, um, performing or checking pedal pulses when you do your head to toe. Because yes, this swollen, shiny uh, um, calf could very well be just a result of, of you know, heart failure, but as we all know, it can also be a sign of a DVT. And that DVT, um, you know, a, a deep vein thrombosis in, in the leg, um, actually, where's that going to go? Gabby, don't answer because we talked about this last night. <laughs> what's what's going to happen if you have a giant clot in your leg? And remember, that clot is just going to go with the body flow. So where's the where's the blood going? If you think it through, what kind of, it's an emboli, it's an emboli for sure. Where is it going to land? Where is it going to cause problems? Right atrium is true. It's going into the right atrium. And then where does it go? To the lungs. Yes. You guys got it. So, so again, it's knowing that blood flow, right? Just think it through. Um, you'll be, you won't, you'll be shocked at how many answers you can, you can find just by doing that. Um, so that's awesome. You so so yes, watch out for DVT with this. But yes, sometimes it is just their heart failure, and it's it's you know we just need to push some Lasix and it'll help. Uh, GI bloating um, it does have effects on the GI system again because it's backing up everywhere, right? And I think that's pretty much everything that's important that I can see. Okay, uh, I'm not sure where I went after this. Doo -doo -doo. 
I usually look these over because I just didn't have time. So, um, all right, we'll do like manifestations. We just talked about manifestations of each side separately, right? Um, there are manifestations that, you know, are going to, um, these are kind of the big things that are going to trigger like, okay, there's something, there's, there's a problem. Heart failure is a possibility. Um, remember that heart failure is progressive, right? So it's something we're going to constantly be keeping an eye on. And all of these things that we're looking at are things that we can monitor to keep an eye on that heart failure. Um, one of the things is uh, nocturia. So um, this is getting up to pee a lot at night. Um, you've got um, dusky skin, cool to the touch, just because you're not getting enough. It's this cardiac output is low, right? Uh, restlessness, confusion, and a decreased memory. Anytime you see restlessness and confusion on a test, think hypoxia. Um, it's it's one of the first symptoms of of hypoxia. J just in general, um, if I have patients that all of a sudden like start to get really, really agitated. It's like one of the first things I do is throw on an O2 set just to see where they're at. Um, chest pain uh, makes sense, right? Uh, weight changes, um, and that can be because of fluid retention, but it can also be because of anorexia, nausea. Um, and so you have to kind of pay attention to what, to the whole clinical picture and what's going on. So um, these are kind of your target organ. Remember when we talked about stroke, I think that was you guys, where we talked about the target, oh no, it was hypertension, the target organ damage, like what's going to happen, right? These are kind of the big target organ um, issues. So the first one is a pleural effusion. Um, so that increase in the, in the pleural capillaries that um, that means the, the capillaries that are inside that kind of pleural sac, right? That are bringing blood, uh, deoxygenated blood to the alveoli and then bringing oxygen away, right? Um, there's an increase in pressure and the fluid gets pushed out sometimes into that, into that pleural space. And again, that pleural space um, you can kind of see it in this picture. It's not quite big enough, um, but you can see it's it's building up in that sac. That's I don't know. I think of it as a sac or a bag that's holding the lungs. Okay, that is that is a pleural effusion, different from pleural edema, which we'll talk about in a minute. Um, you can uh, so some of the other like end end function, you know, problems or whatever. Dysrhythmias, um, when you have an enlargement of the heart chambers, whether it's, you know, uh, left or right ventricle, it's going to stretch out, right? When it stretches out, it actually alters those electrical pathways. The, the impulses that we talked about yesterday um, aren't able to get find their path, their normal path to, to trigger the heart. Um, and that's where you end up with dysrhythmia. Oftentimes, atrial fibrillation is a big one that will result from, um, from heart failure or an MI. Um, but you can have other dysrhythmias as well. Depending on what's, you know, what's dilated and what's, you know, where those pathways are going and so on. Um, another one is the thrombus. You have that enlarged chamber. So we talked about kind of down here when we were looking at these, this complete mess that I've drawn down here, that uh, you've got all that blood backing up. Whether it's backing up in the left ventricle or it's backing up in the right ventricle or both, you have like stasis of fluid. So that, that blood that's supposed to be pumping out is kind of floating around in there. Um, and eventually it will start to clot. Or pieces of it will clot, right? Um, and so those thrombi will form. And if it sits in that ventricle, great, no problem. It's probably not going to do anything. But if it doesn't, it's going to become an embolus. And whether if it's in the left ventricle, it's going to go um, out to the body, meaning pro likely up to, to a stroke. Sometimes it can go somewhere else for sure. Um, but that would be my test question answer. And then the right side, if there's an, a thrombus in there, it's going to go exactly what you guys were saying. It's probably going to end up in the lungs and you're going to have a PE. 
Um, so another target organ that has issues here, uh, your hepatomegaly, so your liver, those liver lobules will become congested with all that fluid and it will just decrease liver function. And same with uh, renal failure, uh, you have that decrease in cardiac output and you had your, your renal kind of response already where the RAS, uh, the, the renin angiotensin aldosterone system kicked in, it's not going to be able to do enough. Um, and so you're going to have decreased perfusion to to the kidneys, and then it's going to to uh, cause um, renal failure. So these are the kind of big things that we are trying to prolong as long as possible. We don't we try to avoid any of these things happening um, by controlling a bunch of uh, symptoms um, by controlling kind of well we'll talk about it when we talk about like the medications I think a little bit more. These are your classifications. Um, quite frankly, I hate these on all of in all of the subjects because it's just a matter of like memorizing. Um, class one is this, but not this. Class two is this, but not this. But it's here. I'm not going to go through it because you guys can read and and can you know memorize it yourselves. There's nothing really pathoey there. <laughs> um, so let's go up here and we'll talk about. Sure, let's go with acute decompensated heart failure. So ADHF, um, the difference between that and your regular kind of heart failure is that it's kind of a sudden, a sudden problem. Like you have heart failure and then all of a sudden all the signs and symptoms just get worse. You gain, you know, you might gain three pounds in a couple of days. Most of that is water, right? Um, you having a really hard time breathing. You, the pedal edema has gotten twice as bad. You're super tired. Those kinds of things. Um, you're going to end up in, in, if, especially if you have left-sided heart failure, you're going to end up in respiratory distress. So we want to deal with that as quickly as possible. Um, when we're talking about this kind of these respiratory issues, we talked about pulmonary effusion. And I think uh, someone in the other group was asking, you know, the difference between pulmonary effusion and pulmonary edema. So let's talk about how pulmonary edema happens a little bit. So you've got your alveola here. Okay, this is this is your little these are your little like endothelial cells of the alveola. This right here is your vein, uh, sorry, I guess it's an artery here, bringing unoxygenated blood, and this is your venule leaving. So it's, it's basically your capillary, right? In between the alveolar sacs, there's this tiny little kind of interstitial space. Um, uh, just, it's, you know what, I'm not going to go through all that, but that's what it looks like. <laughs> um, and so in pulmonary edema, what's happening is you have that, that backup from the left uh, ventricle backing up all the way into the lungs, and it increases that hydrostatic pressure, meaning it's pushing that fluid out of the uh, venules and, or capil or, um, yeah, I guess capillaries and into this interstitial space, into that space in between the capillary and the venule. Okay. Um, that's kind of like the first stage of it. Eventually, oh, one of the crappy things that happens actually is, is your lymph will actually increase um, because it wants to increase the flow of lymph in order to try to drain all of that extra fluid out of that tissue, which can work sometimes if you have mild increase in fluids or uh, there's other reasons that this is going on, that that lymph flow can actually kind of push, sorry, can kind of push through here and, and kind of pull um, through the lymphatic system, pull some of that fluid out. But in this kind of heart failure, um, it really just causes, it worsens the problem um, because it just increases the, the amount of fluid that is then now like in this whole area. And then um, as more fluid is backing up, you've got a little bit of lymph now in there. Um, it's going to actually increase that pressure so much. It's going to push through the interstitial space and right into the alveola. And it's, um, you know, it's going to be your, uh, your fluids. And then I'm guessing these little dots here are, are like, um, um, 
my brain is like sodium, whatever, um, because those are all going to go in there. Some of them, the ones that can pass through that membrane are going to go in there, but that doesn't really matter. The important thing is that the fluid is backing into specifically into the alveola, as opposed to in pleural effusion where it's, this is, I'm so good at drawing where it's actually ending up in this, inside of this kind of sac that's holding um, the lung. I'm just going to check that. I have no idea what you mean, Gabby. Co-waste. C-O-waste? I don't know. <laughs> Full sentences, Gab. <laughs> um, so anyway, that's edema. The difference between edema and pulmonary effusion, not so, it's, it's pretty easy to follow. Um, I think I had some more up here. So what are your kind of symptoms of pulmonary edema? This is the stuff we already kind of talked about. Um, crackles, wheezes, ronchi, dyspnea. You're going to see sometimes patients will use their accessory muscles, um, orthopnea. This is your big test hint that we're talking about pulmonary edema. If you see frothy, blood-tinged, pink sputum, immediately you think pulmonary edema, okay? This does actually come up on tests a lot, um, whether it come up on your test or NCLEX, it, oh, I don't know, it came up in a bunch of mine. Uh, cyanosis, because you're not getting enough gas exchange, you're not getting uh, enough uh, perfusion, right? And then cool and clammy skin, same thing. Um, tachycardia is just your body trying to compensate for uh, the decrease in cardiac output. So you're going to have all of these kind of signs and symptoms. Um, if you guys have ever cared for anyone with heart failure, it, this is like second second nature to you, right? You can, I couldn't think of the word nature. So um, what are we going to do? Uh, what are the interventions? Um, what I would, what I would remember for a test, um, diuretics, which we'll talk about in a second, uh, monitoring your vital signs, fluid intake, your, so your ins and outs have to be monitored. Electrolytes have to be monitored. Anytime we're talking about fluid problems, we're always going to monitor electrolytes because they're so closely related. Um, sorry. And then um, hopefully we're not going to go into this insane like uh, respiratory distress if we can kind of handle this. Uh, we are going to often give oxygen. I don't see that on here, but you should give oxygen too. <laughs> um, this mental status stuff is the same on every exam, so I'm not going to go over it. You just want to like remain calm, speak in a calm voice, um, encourage the patient to talk about their worries and fears and all of that kind of nursey, nursey stuff that we love to answer. Uh, let's go up here. So assessing for heart failure. Um, the So have you guys had your... Um, health assessment kind of class yet where you've you've done all your head to toe a million times and gone through like your tactile fremitus <laughs> stuff that you'll never use in real life in the RPN program but you haven't done it yet here okay awesome so quick quick review then it's not anything new uh, we're assessing for for heart failure this is the kind of history you're going to see the point or the subjective data that you're going to get they're going to be tired uh, they're going to have exercise intolerance um, a d obviously diminished quality of life most people will comment on having a trouble breathing if they have left-sided heart failure um, weight gain if they have a right-sided trouble sleeping is a big one and then cough is another big one um, some kind of change in the appetite can also indicate usually right-sided heart failure um, and so what do we do right away? We've got our kind of clinical history. We're going to do a head to toe assessment and um, a cardiac like this is a cardiac focused head to toe. Um, I still start with a GCS. I think it's really important to uh, rule out any kind of change in a level of consciousness because that could indicate that the patient is or has gone into ha or is having some respiratory uh, like severe respiratory or severe cardiac issues. Right. So we're looking at their general appearance, color, pallor, um, is their skin cool, all of that kind of stuff. Uh, you want to hit your, your cap refill and your JVD. Those are kind of important cardiac 
you know, to, to check. One is to check for perfusion, the other for uh, fluid volume overload. Uh, we're obviously going to listen to heart sounds. Here, though, as nurses, we're not necessarily, uh, we don't need to listen for those we just lis like listen for the presence of a third or fourth heart sound or a murmur, um, but we're not necessarily identifying those, so that's good. And then lung sounds, you will likely hear your crackles, um, wheezes. Ronchi are just like your really uh, uh, like coarse crackles, like kind of big crackles. And then um, you want to do pulses. You want to make sure that you do at least uh, I do at least three in a full, like quick cardiac head to toe. I want to make sure the blood is going everywhere. So I do a quick carotid, radial. I'm always doing radial anyway, right? And then pedal, always with the pedal pulses. Um, and then the other thing is when you're when you're you want to take a quick look at the abdomen. Um, and and check for ascites. You can do that with your stethoscope. You can do it with your hand. If you push very lightly, you can really feel like the fluid has built up in the body. Um, so I think I think what's the important takeaway here for for life, I guess, and possibly for a test, is that a cardiac, a focused cardiac, head to toe is not just heart stuff. Like it is, but you go head to toe. Literally, you need to go head to toe. These pedal pulses can be incredibly important. Um, let's see. So we'll do some blood work. We're going to do a CBC lights because we want to see if there's any electrolyte changes, right? Uh, always do glucose. And then we want to rule out, part of the reason is we want to rule out any comorbid, comorbid conditions like a renal, renal problem or a thyroid problem that could be responsible for, say, their fatigue or their loss in appetite. Um, we want to do um, a BUN. An increase in a BUN uh, can indicate heart failure. BUN is really the one major kind of cardiac marker for, um, sorry, for and did I say BUN? I meant BNP. Oh, I even wrote BUN. BNP. Scratch what I just said. It's BNP, not BUN. BUN is a marker for, for renal, and I guess I just got mixed up. So your BNP is really the one major marker for um, heart failure. Uh, you also have ANP, which is atri atrial uh, natriuretic peptide. Um, Really just, we, we use the BNP because it's more, um, well, if you look here, um, it's, it's, they're both counter-regulatory hormones. One is secreted by the atrium. The other is secreted by the ventricle. And that's why we're kind of more concerned with the BNP because most of the time, if we have heart failure, our problem is in the ventricle not the atria, right? And so um, this hormone is only secreted um, in response to wall stress, meaning an overstretching of that um, or a pressure overload, some kind of, um, some kind of, some kind of like, like stretch really or wall stress against that ventricle wall. That's when your BMP will be released. Um, and so you will see that in your in your blood work. Um, I'm not sure if you guys need to know normals, but they're here. Um, if you do, they are um, right there. Uh, I don't, I didn't memorize them even for the NCLEX, so I don't know that they're that, maybe for this exam, like memorize them, but um, where the heck were we guys? Okay. So, oh my goodness, I can't believe I did that. So BNP um, indicates heart failure. Uh, there are other cardiac enzymes. We want to rule out any other problems, right? So we're going to do a troponin probably. Um, there are other things, but these are like the main, this is, this is the main blood work. This will be done like the minute that patient, um, we see that patient, you're going to do blood work in a head to toe. We will do an echocardiogram. You can, uh, the echocardiogram, if you look here, it shows, so an echocardiogram is like an ultrasound, but it's like an ultrasound of your heart, right? So it, sh it can show like the size and shape of the, of the chambers. And if you look here, you can see the right atrium. 
you can see the left atrium you can see behind because remember the way it's shaped it's in the, the body it's kind of turned so you can see the right atrium and then you can see this ginormous left ventricle so we have even in you can see right in this uh, echo the the dilation kind of of the left ventricle so um, so, so an echocardiogram is a, a good diagnostic tool for heart failure. We will also order a test. Sorry, when I, <laughs> we get to order a lot of this stuff in the ER. So that's why I'm saying we, because there's like advanced, there's directives and stuff for a lot of it. Um, so anyway, we can order a chest x-ray. want to rule out, um, you know, any kind of other cause like pneumonia, but you can also see pulmonary edema or an effusion. Again, you can see the size and the outline of a heart. If you look at this, actually, this is a, uh, it does show cardiomegaly. The heart, this is the heart here. It's quite a bit larger than it should be, right? Um, it is It is easier to see on an echo. So often, if we, if you suspect heart failure and not, um, some other pathology, you probably would do the echo instead of the chest x-ray. And then, um, you know, cardiac stress tests and cardiac catheterization. So cardiac stress test is really going to let tell you like how that, how you, what your cardiac function is, how it's going to affect, um, you know, how it's affecting your ability to function. And then cardiac catheterization is really only used um, if there's some kind of blockage in the coronary uh, vasculature that we want to look at. We want to see if there is uh, a blockage in the vasculature or if we want to fix one. So really, really quickly, uh, oh, sorry, before we move on, ECG, you won't see any really usually any changes on an ECG that are like, oh, that's heart failure. It's not like a STEMI where you see a STEMI. Um, but it's, uh, it's really still important to do an ECG whenever you have cardiac issues whatsoever because there are so many arrhythmias um, that are related to heart failure. We want to make sure that that you know, the patient's not in like some crazy a flutter or a fib that um, we need to take care of right away, right? And then really quickly, if you look at all of these kind of diagnostic tests that I just talked about, there's one thing kind of that we haven't uh, talked about, and that's the ejection fraction. So, I mean, think in your head, where do you, where do you think you'd be able to see that? Um, so they do, for the most part, measure ejection fraction with an echo so you can actually see the amount of blood that is coming out of of well you can see it coming out of both ventricles depending on how you i guess i'm not a radiologist so how you move your little wand around and, and whatever so let's talk about treatments um oops the main goal of therapy, we want to increase our left ventricular function because really, um, even if, so so like I said, most of the time if you have right ventricular, a right-sided heart failure, you probably have left anyway. Um, so, but even if you have right-sided, we still want to increase uh, the function, the amount of blood that's coming out um, in the end. So you want to decrease uh, decrease your intravascular fluid volume. Um, we want to decrease uh, venous return. So what's coming back to and filling up um, the lung and that, or, or, sorry, the lung, let's not fill up the lungs, uh, the ventricles. And a lot of this will depend on, you know, if you have systolic or diastolic or whatever, but you can work through it. Um, you want to decrease the afterload, increase gas exchange and oxygenation, increase cardiac output. This is really our, you know, this is our big one here. We want to increase cardiac output. Of course, we're always going to worry about anxiety. And then the big thing is to preserve any kind of target organ um, damage. These things are all very logical. If you know what preload and afterload are, and you know how they affect the blood flow in the heart. When you come across a question, you'll be fine. Just think it through. Um, so because the disease is progressive um, there and there's no like cure, we can't necessarily fix heart failure. It's a lot about kind of managing the symptoms hopefully decreasing them enough that we can um, give the patient a decent quality of life. So how do we decrease intravascular volume? We can use diabetic, diabetics, diuretics I'll talk about in a second. 
Um, Lasix is the most common. Uh, we can actually that it's pretty much all that we do to decrease intravascular volume. I can't think of anything else either. So, okay. Um, we want to decrease the venous return. So what's coming back, it's very, very similar. Um, we might, um, a little bit different here is we might do IV nitro and that's because it, it, it dilates all of your vessels, right? And that will decrease both your preload and afterload. But nitro, um, before I, uh, nitro is really, really, um, it, it really affects the preload quite a bit more than the afterload. So if you hit a question that's asking you about nitro, preload and afterload, um, it affects preload more so. Um, so we want to, all of these things are very, very logical things that we've talked about. Decrease the preload, um, increase the oxygen supply that's going to the myocardium. These are, um, yeah, but nitro here, I just want to point this. I just, I think, I don't think they did a lot of, um, you didn't have like a lot of information on your slides and stuff about nitro and it, it's super important. It comes up on a lot of tests and stuff, so I'm not, but what I've seen come up is knowing that it affects preload, um, that it dilates the coronary arteries and therefore increases coronary artery circulation, and it's gonna increase the oxygen supply because of that. Um, and then the only time it will affect afterload is if you give it at really, really high doses. So just go with preload for that answer. Um, decreasing systemic vascular resistance, right? We want to decrease the afterload. How do we do that? We decrease blood pressure. Um, so it decreases the amount of pressure the heart is working against. Um, weight management we talked about, so, so important. Um, it can indicate an exacerbation. What's really important to know out of all of this writing is, is what these warning signs are. That's it. Just know that if somebody gains two kilograms over 48 hours or 2.5 kilograms in a week, that can be a sign of an exacerbation and it needs to be reported to the healthcare provider. All of this diet stuff we've talked about before, the only thing that's a little bit different here is this fluid restriction. Um, I think on your slides it said that most people aren't on fluid restriction. And I think that that's true in day-to-day -day life. However, if you have a hospitalized, if you're caring for someone in the hospital, they often have had an exacerbation, so they are on fluid restriction. Anytime you have a patient with heart failure, like always ask, make sure you know if they're on fluid restriction or not. And then of course, we're on sodium restriction. And that's part of our DASH diet anyway, right? And again, it's very repetitive stuff from the hypertension and all those other doohickeys that we looked at. Um, we're running out of time, unfortunately, uh, but nothing that's left is super duper important. Um, <clears throat> if you need to log off, feel free to log off. I don't want to keep you too long, and, and I'm going to quickly go over these, like, uh, like the LVAD and stuff, and then I think that's, oh, no, and then the meds. You guys can come and look, I guess, at the at the this stuff after. I'm not going to be able to get through it all. Um, so you know what? I'm not actually going to go through it. If you look back at this, I went through every single thing that was listed on your slides. So ultra ultra filtration, um, an ICD. Uh, um, I think there's a BiPAP on here somewhere. All of those things, and then your LVAD or your your ventricular assist device, and explained exactly what each one of them are. So you, you can just read through that. And I think that that will help a lot. And then I just, I'm going to highlight the things that we're through here that you need to worry about for, for a test for the most part. Um, you have already focused on thiazide diuretics. The major thing we worry about with thiazide diuretics is the hypokalemia. Right? Keep that in your mind. That's really our big concern. We don't typically use thiazide diuretics for heart failure, typically use it for blood pressure. Uh, it's just not strong enough, really. Um, a loop diuretic, fero like furosemide or Lasix, um, is much, much stronger. We'll give that in an IV push. And if you've ever pushed Lasix, you see that, you see the response very, very quickly. Um, the, the patient will start um, 
up urinating and just it will be like constant 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 depending on how much you give them um, you may as well just stay on the toilet <laughs> for the entire couple of hours that it lasts um, you know I wish I had time to explain all of this um, understanding how how it's working I guess I guess for you just knowing it's working inside of the nephron inside of the the loop of Henley to um, to uh, to pull more fluid out of the, the blood or, or to keep more fluid inside of this this tube right here we want to keep more of it in there so that it's going out into your urine right your bladder whatever um, this this normally pulls out a good deal of water on this side and so in order to do that I guess I'm going through this. In order to do that, what it does is this side of the loop here is permeable to water, but it's not permeable to anything else. This side of the loop here is permeable to um, sodium, potassium, and calcium, but it's not permeable to water. Um, and so what it does is this side here uh, will release a bunch of um, sodium, potassium, and that creates an osmotic gradient so that what's outside of that Henley of the loop is is higher than what's inside the loop and we'll learn more about this when we do our fluids but that pulls the water over here outside so what furosemide does is it stops the body from ridding from getting this uh, potassium and sodium from letting it out of the loop and it, by the, doing that it doesn't pull the water out either so now instead of having this sodium, potassium, calcium, and water that's been pulled out of the nephron, you end up with all of that remaining in the nephron. And what that ends up meaning is that it, it stays in and ends up in the urine. And so that's why you get this huge amounts of urine. But that's also why you end up with sometimes with hyponatremia because all of these guys that were supposed to be pulled out were not pulled out, and especially hypokalemia. And the reason for that is just because we have more serum uh, sodium. We have tons of serum sodium. We have very little uh, serum um, potassium, and that's why you'll see the hypokalemia first. This is your big thing with Lasix. This is what you really need to uh, watch out for uh, on a test and in life. Um, the other thing you might see on a test um, is, is this kidney function. So because of because all of that is happening in the kidney, these nephrons are in the kidney, sorry I didn't mention that, but the nephrons are in the kidney. The kid, it's so much involved with kidney function, you can't give Lasix to a patient who has uh, uh, kidney failure or some kind of kidney uh, if their creatinine is, is at a certain place. And so um, at our hospital, when we give Lasix, they have to have a certain level of creatinine and a certain level of potassium. Oftentimes their potassium is low or bordering and you will give a potassium chloride pill, which is a giant horse pill, um, to the patient with their, with their Lasix, okay? Those are really your big things. You know, be aware that if you're pulling fluid out of the body, you have to keep your eye on the patient, watch out for dehydration, watch out for hypovolemia, same thing. Um, and, and if you're, you're pulling that fluid out, you're also lowering blood pressure, right? So keep an eye out for um, hypotension. It doesn't really uh, have a huge effect on hypotension on its own, but especially if you mix it with something, some of these other heart medications, you could have a very profound hypotension. So loop diuretics, Furosemide, I want you to worry about hypokalemia, uh, pulling all the fluid out. We don't want to pull too much fluid out. Um, keep an eye on their hypertension, hypotension, and then make sure their kidney function and their potassium levels are decent before you give it. The only other one you guys um, fart, had on here, you're lucky. I think only one was like the milrinone and dibutamine, which are basically the same thing. They're inotropic agents. Inotropic means they increase the uh, contractility of the heart. Um, this one works by, it's an adrenergic. Anytime you see adrenergic, we're talking about the sympathetic nervous system. And remember we talked earlier, the sympathetic nervous system triggers that those B receptors on the heart and causes those three things. 
It causes an increase in, in heart rate, an increase in blood pressure, and an increase in cardiac uh, contractility and that's just what this dopamine uh, sorry dopamine is doing it's playing with this system and it's increasing it so that you have a much more a much stronger um, heart contraction more blood is coming out your cardiac output increases only give this as IV in hospital um, we want to watch um, um, just let me see here. Want to watch for rebound hypertension. We will don't give it with something else that um, can increase your cardiac output uh, too much. Um, these aren't like if the patient has a history of hypertension, but but these aren't big. I think just understanding how how it works is good enough. Um, um, that's going to have an exaggerated presser response so it's going to constrict it's going to cause an increase in blood pressure an increase in heart rate just know that and you're good to go and thankfully for some reason you guys don't have to learn about digoxin or digoxin toxicity so that's awesome um but at the same time make sure you know this for your nclex absolutely 100 percent needs to be uh, needs to be covered for your nclex and that's it we got well kind of got through all of it i had to kind of stop go really fast in the last little bit. Whew. So before I turn the recording off, are there any questions about anything that we went through? <laughs> no? Okay, so either you're all asleep or I did such a good job of explaining it that you have no questions. I'm going to go with the second one. Makes me feel better. Um, so um, I'm going to, <laughs> yeah, no problem. I'm going to hit the stop recording.